Uh, it, is, it is wonderful to be with you. Everybody shake it out a little bit. Erwin Clear is with us now, and he is the co-founder and managing director of the Caribbean Immigrant Services Incorporated, CIS, founded in 1995. Erwin, tell us a little bit more about your work how you engage your view of sports and tourism uh, and the trail that's available to be blazed here in keeping with the theme, the title of our panel here. Thank you very much, Mr. Al Jazeera. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and greetings massive. The whole idea here is that my other hat that I wear is that I'm the CEO of Team Jamaica Bickle, an organization we started some 21 years ago, primarily to help our Jamaican athletes that participates at the pen relays, which is the longest running relays in the world. Serving over five, 600 athletes, we have now grown to over 800 athletes, and not just Jamaican athletes, but athletes from Trinidad and Tobago, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Grenada and Bahamas. Our presence at the Penules makes us a significant, has a significant impact. Because today, the Penules, which is arguable, as I said, the longest running relays in the world, now is Jamaica versus the United States. How can and that be? It can be because we prov the Caribbean region produces some of the best athletes in the world. And with that... Oh, you love the panel already. Look at this. And, okay. with, that, and with that, Tony, <laughs> it demonstrates that on every day that they're on the track, they're ambassadors of their respective nations, and they carry the brand, and the brand remains front and center. So it's add value, it's presence, it is sustainable, and it's now for us to find ways to leverage it to ensure we can... Um, have the kind of economic impact on our respective nations. I want to talk about what you'd like to see briefly here moving forward, efforts, the possibility to build bridges between right. these communities, between these island nations and the United States, because that's, that's at the core of what we're talking about here. And the, the, the ingredient here is, this, is that we're talking about the Caribbean diaspora, which, yes, yes. as you know, has become the sexy term used by all our respective nations to address our nationals living outside our, our, our respective islands. And the importance of the diaspora at this particular stage of the product tourism is, is at a critical juncture because we find ourselves where we're in a position to provide the necessary leverage. And that means that we are able to garner all of the intellectual capacities that we share here in the diaspora and provide it as a window of opportunities for you, the professionals in the tourism industry. And by the way, these are unpaid services. They are there to be tapped into. It's for us now to find that linkage and to find that opportunity where we can partner. Yeah, yeah, terrific, terrific. Angelique. Nikki, I'm, I was getting there. I was getting there, Nikki. Nikki Board. And, and Nikki, look, um, she has been an event planner for how many years here? 17 years, specializing in sports. She's been part of several teams that have worked on some of the largest international sporting events in the Caribbean, such as? I've worked on FIFA on the 17 World Cup men's. FIFA? I, yeah, don't bring that up. FIFA? Uh, yeah, um, really? <laughs> Anyone Caribbean interested in says, FIFA in the room? <laughs> Southern Caribbean sailing. Um, I've worked on many TPL cricket, a lot of the international, a lot of the international games that come into the Caribbean, at, from different angles, from outdoor advertising for event planning for logistics. So yeah. I've been involved in a lot of sports. So I'm I'm curious as to your take, and let me tell you something. Once everyone's introduced and we we really get going here, we previewed this conversation over dinner last night. <laughs> Wow. Okay, so what is, what is your take on, on this idea of the possibilities here for sports tourism and, and how that needs to be leveraged uh, moving forward? Okay, let me just, just one step back. Yeah, this. yeah. I am the president of what we call Step A. That's the Sports Tourism Event Planners Alliance. 
And my group uh, started with about 20 sport event planners that primarily hosted our events in Tobago. And we have two events a month in Tobago every year. Sailing, swimming, uh, tennis, golf, fishing, scuba diving, yeah. every, every month. Right. Um, and what we, what we thought, every one of us pulls that tug up that river by ourselves, but together we could do, we could lobby, for instance, in getting not only golf equipment free on planes, right, but right, surfboards, right. kiteboarding, because that's a big problem, cyclists, that kind of thing. Um, but when people think of sports tourism, what do they think about? Do they think about stadium sports tourism? Or are they thinking about the kiteboarders, the golfers, the windsurfers who would come together? So let's, let's put it to the room. Yeah. And I don't want a show of hands. Look, we're, we, can, we can shout it out loud. We, look, we're grown people, grown and sexy. Um, when you think about sports tourism, what do you think about? Do you think about stadiums and stadium events? Do you think about um, uh, activities and... Yeah. Scuba diving, kiteboarding. Right. What, what do you think about the room? Just, just uh, you think about activities. Any other thoughts on what it means, what sports tourism means? We're trying to define it so we can talk about how to maximize it. Any other thoughts? Before I introduce Leah? So, let me introduce Leah Miller. She is the founder and president of Complete Sports Management. That is an all-encompassing sports marketing agency. Leah, it's good to have you on the panel. If you would, talk us through your company's impressive list of achievements. So good morning. Thank you all for having me. And um, a little closer, please. Sure. So the country that I have specifically focused on in the Caribbean is the country of the Bahamas. And I created a men's college basketball tournament called the Battle for Atlantis. And it's become really the premier early season men's Division I college basketball tournament. Duke has won it, Villanova, University of Wisconsin won it this year. And through that, we had to represent the country of the Bahamas in front of the NCAA. So as a nation, it would be sanctioned so we could have this event. After building Battle for Atlantis, after two years from the success of the tournament, I was tapped in to create a, a, a college football bowl game. So we now have the Popeyes Bahamas Bowl. So we have the only college football bowl game played outside the United States currently. Both events are on ESPN. I also launched the SEC Network, which is a division of ESPN down in the Bahamas last year with the University of Kentucky men's college basketball program. So it's been an interesting ride, um, but really having the presence of the media and the government of the Bahamas, it's really brought what sports tourism, in my mind, is to a nation. When you bring, it's a destination. The Atlantis has been a partner of ours and bringing down the tourism and the dollars and sustainable events that are not just a one-time thing, but we have multi-year contracts so that it really is embedded in the United States, which is 90% of the tourism that comes down to the Bahamas. Who are the, who are the principal stakeholders that, that work with you, who you found in the course of your work with the Bahamas, are absolutely necessary in order for sports tourism, for what you're attempting to do? And then, uh, Nikki and Erwin, you can, you can take this on as well. Uh, but Leah, let me start with you. Who are the stakeholders who are absolutely necessary to be on board in a collaborative way for sports tourism to, to happen and to flourish? Sure. So the, you know, the dominant principle is the government of the Bahamas. It's the Ministry of Tourism. They've been an incredible partner. They've been incredibly supportive. Without the endorsement of a nation, it's not going to be successful. And we want to bring something that's going to help develop a country in terms of jobs and influence. So they are hands down the number one most important partner. We've seen a steady growth in numbers anywhere over a three-day period from 110,000 folks to 150,000 folks that comes through the turnstile over a three-day period. And, and the statistics indicate that well over 60%, well over 65% are of Jamaican or Caribbean extraction. And you, what we're talking about here is that the, the demographics of these folks 
you'll find that, that a large majority are college grads. They have the disposable income to travel. But more importantly, are the athletes that comes to the Penn Relays. You're talking about the colleges on the Northeastern Seafront. These will become your clientele in your hotels, in our hotels. So our presence there is critical as we develop that relationship. Because what we're doing is that we're creating an environment that says that these athletes that comes up here and beat you every year, you need to come <laughs> down to our region and find out what we're doing. You know, come down and set up training camps. Come down and visit. And, and that's where it starts. Is that we, happening, the, the, the idea of setting up training camps? Yes, is, it is. It is. I, I mean, right now, Jamaica and the Caribbean boast two of the, the, the premier track clubs in the world. And you now have athletes from all over the world training there. And what is being developed is to have now, similar to what Leah says, about colleges using that environment as part of their training. Yeah. And yeah. that does develop. Because the, the point I want to take here is this, that we are at the embryonic stage where we're setting the platform for things to happen. You well, know? What does that mean, embryonic stage? For example, we are talking about amateur athletes, one. We're talking about the whole platform for sports tourism. I remember, I think Al Sharpton says that in order to continue to enjoy the fruit, you must nourish the root. What that basically means, we're investing right now, you know, creating that awareness. Because if that is not created, then we can set up as all the major things in our islands. Because unfortunately, unlike Bahamas, that has the infrastructure yes. for what Leah just mentioned, most other Caribbean islands will not necessarily attract the ESPN to our sports at that level. So we have to create it at the grassroots level and build on it. And we're fortunate that we are able to have a Usain Bolt that came on the scene. And of course, the rest is history. Talk to us about how... Mr. Bolt, and the fastest man on the planet, has propelled Jamaica the brand. Well, I think um, Minister Wichcombe said it accurately when he was at the Diaspora Forum on, Mon on Tuesday. And he said the people, the stadium was filled because they were there to see Bolt. The Bolt factor. I remember one year at the pen relays, every seat was sold. The pen relays is a continuous meet, meaning that there's always a race on the field. And when he stepped on, the commentators gave up and said, Bolt is here. And the crowd just went wild. Yeah, yeah. And when he was finished racing, the stadium emptied. So the impact there is that I think he has, he's a charismatic person. Right. Right? And the fact that he has demonstrated what he has done on the track, he has also brought others with him because no. Um, you'll find that Jamaica is producing 100 meters and 200 meter at least that we probably now can export mm -hmm. because the field is crowded. So it has, it, it, it has inspired, it has instilled. At the same token, he has become a good brand ambassador, not just for Jamaica, but for the Caribbean region. So Nikki, talk about, I know there's, uh, there's some construction of facilities and some facilities are about to open. Uh, talk about, Erwin was making the point about infrastructure being built and the groundwork being laid and paved, that's happening in Trinidad, isn't it? Yes, um, unbeknownst to many, many people in the world, Trinidad has five uh, pro professional football states, it's soccer, the Americans. Uh, they can hold from 15,000 to 25,000 people, five of one in Tobago, four in Trinidad. We have netball stadium, we have gymnastics stadium, we have hockey stadium, grass hockey, and we're just, not, we're just finishing a uh, uh, cycling velodrome, yes. a sw an aquatic center that has diving and swimming, and we also have a, a tennis stadium. That will be opening by, I would imagine, end of August, it should be, yeah. Mm. So we have been putting down, and the sport, in, on, in the Ministry of Sport and the sport, sport company, we have been investing in our, in our athletes for, I would say, heavily, heavily yeah. concentrated maybe 15 years, and we've been doing it across the board. Not just soccer players, not just cricketers, tennis, women. Yeah. They're investing right across the board because we, what, what Trinidad and Tobago is focusing on is becoming a, an off-season training camp. I, I see, so I that see. As we have teams coming in from Australia to, for rugby, 
New Zealand cricket, we have tennis. So that is where we're going, and we and when looking at North America. So you're America, not necessarily trying to compete for the tier one events because they're they're tough to get. Everyone's well, after those events. Well, well, you have to start somewhere. Right. And we have tier one athletes. Right. And of course we do. Yeah. And yeah. and and um, when you have teams, professional teams, high standard of teams that train in your country, that lifts the standard of your athletes. Right. 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 Because the better you the harder competition, the better you get. And teams don't travel by themselves. Yeah. So, for instance, um, another, one of the other ways we're going is the Masters Games. In Tobago, starting very in June the 16th or 17th, we have the Masters. All the Masters from Chelsea, Man U, Liverpool, come into play a weekend of sport in Tobago. Yes. And these, these are where we're going. If you can't have a World Cup, you can have a Masters World gotcha, Cup. Gotcha, gotcha. Those, those kind of things. So, uh, you know, Leah, I, I want to understand from you, and based on your experience, again, not all of these islands can grab a Tier 1 event. But what is it that, in your experience in building out your company, what is it that, that U.S. marketers want? They, they know the sun is there. They know the sand, the beach. They, they know that's all there. But what is it, what's the ingredient that's going to be necessary in order for big marketers, uh, maybe bigger events, to, to seek out destinations in the Caribbean and to base those destinations uh, on those islands what needs to, it gets back to my whole idea about the other stakeholders. What, what does your experience tell you about what the ESPNs of the world want and to the extent the, the islands are in a position to capitalize on that? Sure, so clearly there are you know, hundreds of college basketball events, but there's none in the Bahamas and there's none in the Caribbean, Division I men. So you've got to develop a niche and a saturated market. So you saw that as an opportunity? 100%. Yeah. Untapped territory. And so, who did you talk to? Again, it brings us back to the stakeholders. Who's at the table? Who did you have conversations with? And how do you get someone like the worldwide leader in sports to, to sign on? Well, I went to the very top. I went to the, the head of ESPN. He's a big North Carolina grad. So I went to him and said, we've got North Carolina playing in this tournament. Where's ESPN? We need your focus. We need your exposure. We need your network. So, you know, it goes back to the Ministry of Tourism as well as the Prime Minister. They were very, very, very influential and positive and excited about this event to bring a top-tier college basketball tournament to a country that had never had this before. So with ESPN, they jumped at the opportunity to, to stay in a five-star resort, to televise something, give them sexy content in a time of year where college basketball And what basketball does the big started. data look like on that in terms of eyeballs and, and numbers of people sure. who are watching and see the destination? And again, we know that not every island can do what uh, the Bahamas is able to do, but what does that mean in terms of eyeballs and, and views to your destination? Well, for the football game, we're in 110 million households live, and that's just for the on-air live broadcast, and then they re-air it, so it's another several million, yeah. uh, millions of people, or eyeballs, they would say. So in terms of the exposure, it's unprecedented. Right. You know, they have events that are in the Bahamas that are incredibly successful in the Caribbean and locally, but they're not moving the needle in terms of tourism. Right, and right. this is what's moving the needle in terms of tourism. Right, right, right. Uh, we only had a few minutes left because my, my promise is to get you to lunch and I'm going to be a man of my word. Uh, I want to work in your questions. Any thoughts, questions before I keep firing away here? My man. Yeah. And in your name first. My name is Greg Phillip. I'm CEO of the Nevis Tourism Authority. And I'm speaking really from the perspective of someone who has been involved in sport tourism for a number of years and really and truly fighting an uphill battle. Fighting an uphill, that's better. Yeah. Fighting an uphill battle with a number of things. Um, the, there's a few sporting activities that I've personally been involved in in hosting. Um, the Nevis to Sinkage Cross Channel Swim, that's an open water swimming event. We've been doing that for the past um, 13 years. Um, this year we're in our 14th year of the Nevis International Triathlon, and we also have the Nevis Marathon. 
there's a few things that I think um, for small islands in the Caribbean that we, we face as challenging. And I just want, I'll, I'll mention some of them, and I'll just want you to speak to how small islands like ours can really overcome those. And firstly, um, one of them is the cost of travel. That, that um, has given us so, so many challenges. And has, the cost of travel for people, especially within the Caribbean, um, we had a very vibrant um, cycling scene on the island of Nevis, which was really supported by the guys coming from um, Trinidad, Barbados, um, St. Martin, etc. Now they, they, they'll tell you, I, I can't come because that's costing me more than it takes to go to the States. Then we also, we also have the other uphill battle that we face is the mindset. Many of the powers that be in the Caribbean, and when I say powers that be, I'm talking about sponsorship. I'm even speaking about, in some cases, um, where you need support from the government. They are not turned on to the, the benefits, if you will, of sport tourism. Well, that's, that's the point. I think that it's not so much the investment. It's um, the return. The return, has not, the return that they perceive has not inspired the investment that they should be, if I can put it that way. And then, the other, the other part of it, which I, which I think um, really also hurts us, but this is a bigger issue, is um, the issue of sport development. Yeah, we can talk so much about all the talent that there is in the Caribbean um, from a, an athletics point of view, but guess what? I can tell you, knowing firsthand, that what we see on TV getting get to the professional levels, that is only the very, very tip of the iceberg. There is so much other talent in the Caribbean that really goes a begging. And it's happening for, for a particular reason. It's because investment in sport is really not there in the Caribbean to ensure that we develop our athletes. Yes. And, and it, it's, re it's really for this reason that we see it so much that you have all these young athletes that you think, yes, they're, they're, where they are now in their age group in the world, they have to be among possibly the best in the Caribbean and possibly ranked worldwide. But after a certain age, they, it just goes. With our involvement at the pin release, and I use that as an example because I also say to you that next week right here in New York, the Adidas Grand Prix will take place. It became a Grand Prix because of the participation of Caribbean and Jamaican nationals here in New York to take to that level. And of course, Mr. Bolt will be there, so it's already sold out. All right? Now, with us at the Penrolays and our athletes, our major stakeholder here were our businesses. And the major business was Grace Kennedy. They, they developed a relationship with high school athletics from in Jamaica, because you know we host, we, we have, every year we call it high school championships, which is 105 years running. It's no other meet like that in the world. And they have now become the major sponsor at the pen release. So what we have here, Tony, as far as support, is that we now have a major corporate entity that is the driver. Because in that now, the payoff for them is that their product is now being marketed here in these United States to the extent where, and I congratulate them. But they th found a high enough profile yes. event to attach their name to yes. to get what they consider to be right. and in so doing, a return. Karen, and in so doing, using the athletes as the ambassadors. So it's a win-win formula. So we are fortunate from that perspective. And I, do, I dare say is that Caribbean businesses must understand that there is an opportunity here there to partner with situations like that and that sports tourism does not exist in isolation. There are peripheral businesses that needs to be attached to it because there are benefits that can be garnered from such a relationship. Any other quick questions? We've got, uh, uh, great, great, great. Uh, um, Nikki, did you want to jump on that? Did you, anyone else want to comment on that? Hugh? Thank you. I have a quick question. Hugh Riley, Caribbean Tourism Organization. A very quick how-to question. One of the components, of course, of, of tourism, young tourism, is that the youngsters will become tourists themselves as they, as they grow older. How can you help us in the Caribbean to, to, to reach 
uh, teams of, of high school athletes, maybe, in the upscale schools here in the tri-state area, or anywhere in the United States, to come to the Caribbean and compete against each other and against our, our high school kids uh, in, in athletics or soccer or anything else. They'll bring their parents with them. They'll, they'll, the competition can start to spread around the Caribbean. How can you help us to, to, to do that? We have partnered with South Africa, Canada, England. We are now in, have developing a very close relationship with CAA right here in New York. And a matter of fact, I'm hosting a, a golf tournament on Tuesday with 50 of the top Fortune 500 executives in Trinidad. And the, the effort we're doing is we're trying to bring these guys who are in touch on the ground here, the agents of sporting, um, like Cristiano Ronaldo's agent, et cetera, to come to Trinidad to see what we have there and also get in touch with other, like your tri-state guys and, and encourage them to come and use Trinidad as I would say, training ground, come and play against our athletes so that they, our teenagers and our high school kids get to compete against yours. And as I said before, yeah. when you compete, you, you become better yeah. and you start seeing the next Usain Bolt. You start right. seeing the next Brian Lara and those things. Let me get a question from a good friend of mine, a former Chief Diversity Officer for the United States Tennis Association. Kevin, get up here. Kevin Clayton. Good morning. I'm a managing partner of a company called Jump Ball, and this question is to you, Leah, and first, congratulations on what you've been able to accomplish. Uh, so I do have a question. In my experience in taking events to outside the United States, one of our responsibilities is to connect with the local communities as well. And when I look at, like, the Maui Invitational and the uh, San Juan Classic on TV, you look in the stands, and it's not really a lot of people in the stands would would suggest that a TV event is not necessarily connecting with the local economy to drive revenue. So what have you been able to do, and I guess really asking those who have done business in the Bahamas, how are we connecting with, how is your event connecting with the local community to drive participation, which also supports sponsors? Sure, no, it's a great question. You know, with Battle for Atlantis, I mean, that is a, it, it's a heads and beds event. It, it was specifically tailored for the Atlantis. And because of the success of that, that's when I was tapped into creating the Popeye's Bahamas Bowl. And that is specifically for the locals. And not only is it driving tourism, but it's creating a retention rate. And we're giving a percentage of sales back to a place called the Rand Furley Home for Abused Children. So we actually give them more money than the government of the Bahamas does. So we have a huge, huge local effort and that was part of the sell to the government of the Bahamas. You know, this is not us coming down and instilling the American way. We want to keep the fabric of this country. We want people to see that the Bahamas is more than dolphins swimming at the Atlantis. We want to expose the beauty and just the natural habitat that is the Bahamas. So it's actually the local, you know, outreach has been incredible and Really, the way that they have embraced this has been the most beautiful part of creating. The, the bowl game has been, for me personally, you know, much more of a success just you know, seeing the excitement and seeing really the fanfare and the camaraderie that's been built there in the Bahamas locally. Uh, any more questions before I sort of wrap things up? You know, Tony? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to address the question that you asked because, yeah. you see, it's, it's very important here because... I, I, I was happy to hear that question, in fact, and I wanted to respond to it. What, what is happening here is that my children is born, are born here. My children are born here. So the 3.5 or the 3 to 7 million Caribbean nationals in the United States, people are having children here. Right. So the argument is this, is that as we compete, even when we compete at the pen relays, for example, here, if it's not a... If, if a, if a Perchance a team beats a, a Jamaican team. Guaranteed, there are two Caribbean nationals on that team that defeated that team. And what you find now is that those high schools are now also sending some of their athletes to meet in Jamaica. And when that happens now, the encouragement is that parents do travel with their children. And, and we at Team Jamaica, because several years ago, there's a meet that's a similar relay similarly to the pen relays called the Gibson relays, started taking down teams of non-Jamaicans 
to these meats to expose them. So that is something that partnership and innovative thinking on behalf of hoteliers and those in charge of the tourism aspect, we can build out. And the last but not least is this, 5Ks. I think Jamaica is now becoming the capital of 5Ks in the Caribbean because every week there are two 5Ks there. And what has happened now is that we are now mirroring that here, trying to develop these 5Ks and use prizes as trips to Jamaica to participate in the reggae marathon in the grill. So we find that we are attracting folks through that mechanism. It is a small process, but it's a deliberate process that can be built on. Is, is it all, every island for itself, or is there a way to marshal the resources of the islands, uh, dollars from everyone, to put on events, maybe events that travel? You see, and, and that's where I, I, don't know. I, I agree, I, and that's where we have to go, and, and, and that's why, for example, we we do not exist here in the diaspora as just Jamaicans or Trinidadians. We are in a group called the Caribbean community. Yes. However, we still go back home to our Jamaican home and our Trinidadian home, but through sports, there's an opportunity to do so. And that is why what we do at the Pen Relays, by embracing our Caribbean brothers and sisters there, and, and, and at the same time, encouraging other Caribbean islands to send teams to the Pen Relays, so that they too can experience the opportunity that's there for the respective nations. Can I? Can I Absolutely. Um, we have had as a Caribbean people in the last 85 odd years, cricket in the Caribbean. Everybody knows about that. That's the one thing we do together. And yes, in the background we fight. But when we would stay out of this, right? So, so we do that well. We know how to do this. So it shouldn't be so difficult, but it is. Two years ago, we went to um, my team and, and some from the tourism board went to the World Travel Market in the UK. And we were approached by the guys who put on a British type Tour de France. Can't think of their name right now. And they cycled from Scotland through Wales and the UK right down to Canary Wharf, etc. And they approached us to try to get the region. They wanted five, five islands in the Caribbean that they could cycle through. And I was speaking to them like, don't do the same islands that have the same terrain, do some that are more forested, some more hilly, some flat beach and so. And they were very interested in bringing hundreds of international cyclists to do this. And it never got off the ground. And I, I think that points, I, give, I was giving them the example last night. I have some friends that live in Belize. 17 years ago, they started a race in Tunisia. And that race goes from Tunisia to South Africa. Can you imagine the logistics? border control, security to, to cycle down Africa. And if they could do it, peaceful Caribbean, we can't do this. And we need to get together as a Caribbean nation to make things easier. They passed, um, what's the name, what would they call a, a something clause where you could, have part, you could have sunset legislation, right, where you could come through the Caribbean for the World Cup, for instance. So we've done it before. But there is a need for, and I keep saying this. Well, what's that level? Is that CARICOM this level? Is CARICOM is that level. Is this has CARICOM to be on level. CARICOM level. But there also, some, somebody spoke about travel. Yeah. You can't have a policy in the Caribbean with the airlines especially that I can't bring my kite board. I have to pick. A kite board bag is about this big. And, but golf is allowed free on airlines. But you're charging me 50 US for, for a board as big as a skateboard. And you want me to come and travel the Caribbean? That's not making any sense. So you have, we have to think on a larger level. We have airline issues. It's very difficult to get to St. Kitts. It's very difficult to St. Bart's. It's very difficult to Nevis, especially from Trinidad. So, and, and it's more expensive to go to Barbados than it is to come to New York. Wow. That's insanity. Wow. Yes, I mean, but Trinidadians go everywhere because that's what we do. Right. But really, if you want to encourage Caribbean tourism, these things must be taken care of. They, you can't be putting blocks in front of people who want to come to our islands, especially in terms of sport. I was telling them last night, there are teams that come in to, to, to play cricket or football. They come for a week and they leave. A windsurfer will stay for three months. And he will stay in Granny's little room and eat 
food from there and, and in Tobago, for instance, and stay for three months. And the sea is free. And he or she will stay. So what is... My, my point is you have to not look at it only in terms of stadium sports. You have to look at it in the ones that come for a short time, spend a fortune, and those that In spend addition to stadium sports. Correct, and, and look for the, the one who stays for three months. So, know? as we wrap this up, last thought from each of you. Um, there is a real opportunity for sports tourism to be a real driver in the larger tourism space for Caribbean nations if, fill in the blank. We recognize our niche, and um, we, you know, we, we cannot be everything. No island has a capacity to do everything, um, probably except Trinidad, because you, know, they have, you guys have more money than, I'm only kidding. But the point here is, is, is that based on our size, our capacities, so I think we identify our niche, and we work it in collaboration with others. And I think then you can market the Caribbean as a destination because we know that the, the things that... The, which that, we haven't talked about. Which enough. we haven't talked right, about. Right, right. And I think that's the way you're approaching it. What's happening in Bahamas is, is, is representative of the Caribbean. Not just Bahamas, representative of the Caribbean. Right. And what happens in Trinidad, their, their, their expertise and their, their presentations is a representative aspect of the Caribbean. And I think with that, I think we could find more traffic in that, in that endeavor. And the infrastructures must be in place. So, Leah, uh, sports tourism has an opportunity to be a driver in a larger tourism space for uh, Caribbean nations if... There has to be a buy-in from all parties. The, the single key is the buy-in. Who's your audience? For the Bahamas, it's the Americans, because that's 90% of tourism. Tourism is our main driver. So you've got to have the buy-in from the American party, the media, the Bahamian government, and the locals, and that's what we've been able and to do. And is that a model that can be replicated? 100%. Jamaica, Trinidad, It doesn't matter Antigua's where it is. Smaller, that's the formula Island, for the success. Nevis, that's the... 100%. I think you gave us your answer. When, uh, uh, first, you got another I, thought? I just one little thing to say. Yeah. I think being here means that they're starting to listen. Mm. Because six years ago, I couldn't get anybody to listen to me about sports tourism. So let's take it on the road. So it's on the road. The sponsors are beginning to understand that it is a valuable thing to get involved in. And I think together, OK, Jamaica is like, everybody has a specialty that they're good at. But together, we have much more than you would think. And with that, how about a round of applause for our panel? Thank you all.